Well, today is Reformation Sunday, and so we're going to do our message time a little different than normal. Usually we are going through the Gospel of Matthew verse by verse and studying it. But today I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. As we look together at God's Word and we understand the Protestant Reformation and the work of God through the man Martin Luther. Now, of course, Martin Luther was not a perfect man, because all of us have sinned. And Luther had many shortcomings and many faults that he took part in in his life. But we must understand that Luther was used greatly of God, and so as well, you and I can be used of God in this day to start a new Reformation, to see change and see the church empowered by the Word of God, to see people's lives strengthened through Christ, to see faith triumph in this world, to see the power that comes through God alone manifested in your homes and in your families. And that's my prayer. That's why I serve as a pastor, is because I want to see God's changing power at work in your lives. I want to see you strengthened because you are in God's house, and because you're in God's Word, and because God is with you. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, were the two verses that had the greatest impact on Martin Luther and on the Protestant Reformation. So if you will, look with me at those verses, and then we'll go to our Lord in prayer. The Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. May we go to our Father in prayer. Lord God, we ask now that you will inspire our hearts this morning. That you will open them unto the truths of your word as we study them today. That you will use us in a great and mighty way to bring about change in our city, change in our homes and our families and our marriages. Lord, that we will be used by you. Lord, help us to understand these great truths of the Reformation and to share them with others. May we never forget the hall of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, as well as these modern day men and women of God used by you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Martin Luther was a great man of God used in great and mighty ways in this world. No doubt he was the man whom God used to influence the pages of history in an incredible way. He influenced the world through his teaching and through his preaching. John Calvin in Geneva, Switzerland was influenced through his work, the Presbyterians, John Knox in Scotland. Through his work, the Church of England and the English people heard the gospel. The Puritans who were in England and came to America and founded this nation were based off of the works and the preaching of Martin Luther. John Wesley, Charles Wesley and the Methodist, because of Luther's stand, heard the gospel. The Huguenots in France and the French people who trusted in Christ. All through the work of one man by the power of God with a commitment to the scriptures. 540 million people, as I said earlier in our service, meet today in churches that were inspired by the Reformation and inspired by the preaching and the teaching of Martin Luther. This morning I want to talk to you about the man in Martin Luther. And then I want to talk to you about the message, the message of the Reformation. We've read together Romans 1, 16 and 17. We'll delve into that in just a little bit. But first, let's look at the man of God. And let's understand how God used this great saint. Martin Luther was born November 10th, 1483. He served God over 60 years in this world before he was taken home. He was born in Eiselben, Germany, into a middle class family. The following morning after his birth, he was baptized on the feast day of St. Martin of Tours into the Roman Catholic Church. And so began his entrance into the religious systems of this world. Martin Luther had a very humble beginning. As I said, a middle class family who had to work hard to survive. Luther has written of his lineage, I am a peasant's son. My father, my grandfather, and my great grandfather were genuine peasants. My father was a poor miner, and my mother carried wood from the forest on her back. They both worked their flesh off, their bones, in order to bring up their children. Luther came from a very unprivileged household. But you see, friend, when God gets a hold of you, he can do extraordinary things with ordinary people. Amen? 
At the age of 17, in the year 1501, Luther entered the University of Erfurt. The university at that day was a place of learning, but it was also a place of idolatry, a place of infidelity. Luther would later describe the university as a beer house and a place of ill repute. Of course, not much has changed today, unfortunately, in our universities and colleges in America. In the year 1505, he graduated from this University of Erfurt with degrees, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in the liberal arts. He earned both degrees in the minimal amount of time required and graduated second in his class. Truly, God had gifted him with the ability to discern and use knowledge. Following this, in accordance with his father's wishes, history tells us Luther enrolled in that same school, in the school of law, and was a law student that year. While a student, an influential event happened in Luther's life, which we can find described in many of his writings, as well as writings of historians. As he was traveling on horseback one day, leaving home, going back to the university, a violent thunderstorm swept across Germany, and a lightning bolt struck near him as he was returning to the university. He fell from his horse in terror, and he cried out to his father's patron saint in the Roman Catholic Church, Help me, St. Anna. And as he was falling on the ground, he continued, Help me and I will become a monk. He came to view his cry for help as a vow that he could never break. And later when he told his father, who was very disappointed in him for leaving law school about this, he explained to his father he was terrified of death, terrified of being judged one day. The Bible says it is appointed unto a person once to die. And after this, the judgment. And Luther had no peace. He was not ready to meet the Creator at this time. And this is why he made this vow, the Saint Anne. While history tells us he left law school, he sold his books, and he entered the strictest order of monks at an Augustian friary in Erfurt on July 17, 1505. Luther dedicated himself to monastic living devoting himself to long fast, abstaining from foods and drink, long hours in prayer, pilgrimages to different holy sites, frequent confession to the priest in the monkery. In fact, he confessed to his priest so often that he wore the priest out. The priest literally stopped taking confessions after having to hear all of Martin Luther's petty and continual sins. Luther tried to please God through this dedication, through these works, but it only increased his awareness of sin and tore him up more inside. Luther writes that he subjected his body to such physical punishment that he permanently injured his health. Throughout the later years of his life, he really suffered because of the things he did to himself as a monk, all in the attempt to try to earn heaven. He would go without food for days, stay awake all night to say his prayers. He would perform acts of penance for hours on end, doing and working and trying to make himself right with God. He writes that he even laid out naked in the snow on a cold German winter night as an act of trying to find forgiveness and peace with God, thinking the pain he was excruciating himself with would somehow make him pay for the sins he had committed, but to no avail. He committed the act of self-flagellation, where he would whip himself until blood would flow down his body in an attempt to atone for his sins, knowing that the Bible says the life of the flesh is the blood, and he attempted to try to pay for his sins to no avail. No doubt that these attacks on his body and on his being not only shorten his life, but it caused great sickness. Later in Luther's life, he made some very condemnable statements that we would not agree with. Many anti-Semitic statements. And we believe it was because of his health. After suffering for many years, he was ordained a priest in the Roman Catholic system in 1507. And he confessed publicly his obedience to God, to Mary, and to St. Augustine, who was the founder of his monastic order. Luther said, We had to atone for ourselves in the Roman system. And since we could not make sufficient amends or do acceptable works, our teachers directed us to the saints in heaven and made us call upon Mary and implore her to avert us from Jesus' wrath. You see, at this time, Christ's love, the love of Jesus for the world, was unknown of in the history of the church. Rome rarely taught this doctrine that God 
could be a God of mercy and a God of love. Luther was not reading the Bible in his day, and he did not know the great passages like Ephesians 2 that says, For by grace are we saved through faith. It's not of our works, lest any man should boast. He really, firmly, and truly believed doing these things would take him closer to God and bring him to heaven. Luther did not have the Bible in front of him to read Titus 3, which says we are saved not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy. Well, Luther's superior monk in the monastery was frustrated with Luther and saddened for him because of the terrible, excruciating mental and physical problems that he was going through. And he concluded that Luther needed something more to distract him so he would not continue to harm himself in this way. So his leading monk led him and ordered him to pursue a continued academic career in the religious fields. In 1508, he began studying theology at the University of Wittenberg. He received another bachelor's degree in biblical studies on March 9, 1508, and later a Master of Sacred Theology degree. At this point in Luther's life, he finally was able to get a hold of the Bible and begin to study the Bible. And it was at this time that Romans 1, 16 and 17 truly began to challenge his heart. We've read this text already. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. I want you to notice here it says we are not ashamed of the gospel. At that time Luther did find the shame in himself. A shame in the truths of God. He did not know for sure he was in the arms of a loving God. He did not know if God could forgive his sin. But when he read this verse, he realized that the apostles could be strong and bold in their faith. They could have assurance. They did not have to be ashamed. And then verse 17 really pricked his heart. He described it as an arrow literally going through his heart or a bolt of lightning striking him. This was the first seed that was planting toward his salvation. He read here that the righteousness of God, the way to be right with God is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, if you look at the lives of true Christians, you see their faith. You see how God has worked through them. As it is written in the book of Habakkuk, the just, those who have been made right with God, shall live by faith. The just are not made right with God by works, but by faith, by trusting, by believing in Jesus Christ. These were the truths that began to convict Luther. As we continue looking into his life, we find the man, Martin Luther, in 1510, taking a religious pilgrimage to Rome. As Luther the monk went there, he was appalled to find great corruption in the city, worldliness to the extreme in the papal court, prostitution and the abuse of religion and the people that came to Rome seeking God was on every corner. You could see holy relics all over the city that you had to pay money to see. And if you gave your money and you prayed over the relics, supposedly it would take time off of your years in the Catholic purgatory, which of course is not scriptural. He found in Rome prostitution and brothels even for the priest to go in. It was a time that truly caused him to question whether the church had totally departed from the faith. One of the things that a good Catholic was supposed to do at his time, and even many of these things are done today, was to climb the steps in Rome called the Scala Santa. And they were to climb these steps on their knees. And every step they went up, the church told them they would find forgiveness of sins. They could find years out of purgatory. And even if your relatives, if you did it for your former relatives who had died, every time you prayed on a step, you would release one of your relatives from purgatory. So Luther began the ascent up this great steep stairway. And as he went up it praying, all of a sudden the scripture of Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith, pierced his heart again. And he realized these steps could not save anybody. And his son, Paul, later on in his life, wrote here that Luther suddenly considered the scripture. He stood up and he walked down the steps, realizing these works could not save him. He realized then that Rome had turned opposite of what the scriptures had said. And this challenged his view of the church and led him to continue a thorough study of the Bible. On October 19, 1512, Luther was awarded a doctorate of theology at Wittenberg. And on October 21, 1512, he was received into the Senate of the Theological Faculty at Wittenberg, being called to the professor or the doctor of Bible. He was one of the leading theologians of his day. 
because of his intense study. From 1510 to 1520, history tells us that Luther lectured on many books of the Bible. He lectured on the book of Psalms from 1513 to 1515, Romans from 1515 to 1516, Galatians from 16 to 17, Hebrews from 17 to 18. As he studied these portions of the Bible, he became convinced that his church had lost sight of what he saw as the central truth of Christianity. Salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. The doctrine of justification. God's looking at us sinners and declaring us right with him. He began to preach this truth in Wittenberg. He was called as the people's priest in 1516. And he stood in the pulpit week after week and taught the word of God to the people. And he explained that salvation only comes through the gift of God's grace. Only through faith in Jesus Christ. At this time, his church that he was a part of, the Roman Catholic system, was murdering those who revolted against it. It was killing the Waldensian preachers who would preach on the street corner. Killing the followers of John Wycliffe who went out and took the first English copies of the Word of God and were sharing it to the people abroad. One of the things that most angered Luther and most caused him to question the church was what was called the selling of indulgences. There was a Dominican friar in Luther's day named Johann Tetzel. And he sold these indulgences for Pope Leo X. Half of the money that would go to the certificate would go to the German national leader. And the other half of the money would go to the Pope himself to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, which is still standing today. An indulgence, if you're wondering, was a certificate which was signed by the Pope that stated a person was excused from doing good works, from prayers or money or lighting candles or inflicting pain on themselves and penance, and would relieve their time they would be forced to suffer in purgatory, or at least shorten it if they bought an indulgence for the right price. Also, indulgences were sold to get a father or a mother or a family member out of this made-up place called purgatory. You see, the Catholic Church taught that when a soul died, they would have to go to a purgatory, a place, an intermediate state, where they would suffer for their sins. And after so much suffering in purgatory, eventually... They could get to heaven if enough people prayed them out. And these indulgences were kind of a get out of purgatory ticket. In fact, Johann Tetzel said as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. This was the essence of Rome's teaching at this time. History tells us on October 31st, 1517, Luther did something that shook Europe and later the world, including America. October 31st celebrates Reformation Day, which is why we have this special service once a year. The Reformation that began in Europe by Martin Luther going to the church door at Wittenberg. And he wrote something called the 95 Thesis. 95 points explaining that indulgences could not save you. Works could not save you. The Pope could not save you. God alone could save your soul. First words of the 95 Thesis were these. He wrote, out of a love for the truth and a desire to bring it to light. The following propositions will be discussed. He wrote that he requested those who are unable to present and debate with us may do so by letter in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And here's a few of the points of the 95 Theses that I want you to understand. Point five said the Pope does not intend to remit and cannot remit any penalties other than that which he has imposed by his authority or by the canons. In other words, the Pope can't forgive sins like he was teaching. He can only forgive penalties that he has put on people. Point six said the Pope cannot remit any guilt. He can't take away guilt from a soul. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Point 21 said those preachers of indulgences, those who are selling people's salvation are in error, who say that by the Pope's indulgences, a man is freed from every penalty and saved. On point 36, he said every truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt, even without letters of pardon. On point 62, he said the true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and the grace of God. These are the things that save the grace of God, not the works, not paying money for your salvation. 
Within two weeks, this thesis was taken off the doors at Wittenberg. It was translated into the common German language. It was spread abroad throughout Germany. And it caused many people to question whether that piece of paper they had spent so much money for could really do anything for them at all. Within two months, it had been translated into many languages throughout Europe due to the recent invention of the printing press. About a year after this, Luther again began studying Romans 1 in detail. And that small seed that was planted a few years earlier began to grow into his heart. And it blossomed and it turned into saving faith for Luther. Let me read you Luther's own words. He said, at last, thinking over the matter for days and nights, God showed me mercy and the connection of these words with the following sentence. The just shall live by faith. I saw the meaning of this verse to be, through the gospel is revealed that righteousness of God by which the merciful God declares the believers righteous. In other words, God makes us righteous. We don't make ourselves righteous. God makes us right with God. We don't make ourselves right with God. The one justified by faith shall live. Now I felt myself newborn and in paradise. All the holy scriptures look different to me. This passage in Paul appeared to me as the gate of paradise, Luther said. And I believe it was this point Luther experienced a new birth. He was changed by God. He was saved. And he became a great warrior for the gospel of Jesus Christ. His thesis was translated into many different languages and spread throughout the Roman Empire. Luther began writing books and tracts each week, distributing them abroad about the scriptures, about the reformation that was needed. Luther did not want to split the Roman Catholic Church. He wanted the gospel of Jesus Christ to change the Roman Catholic system. This led to many going to the scriptures to see what the Bible said. It led to what we have today is modern day Methodism and Presbyterianism and Lutheranism. And the Reformed Church, and even the Church of England, and the Anglican Church, the Episcopalian Church. All these come from the strong teaching of Luther, even though many have fallen away from that teaching today. Eventually, the writings of Luther so angered the Pope, Pope Leo X, that he issued a papal bull, denouncing everything that Luther had taught and demanded Luther's arrest. This bull prohibited all people to, in any way, read, quote, preach, Commend, print, publish, or defend the writings of Luther, since they spread this pestilence and cancerous disease. Luther, the man's man that he was, took the papal bull in Wittenberg, and he burnt it in front of the people. He wrote back to the Pope, You, Leo X, I exhort and admonish in the Lord to repent and to make an end of these diabolical blasphemy, to say that people could be saved by putting money in the coffer. Until this be done, know that I will regard your bishop as of Satan, as the accursed mode of Antichrist, who we cannot obey, but we must detest and see as the chief enemy of Christ. As the Apostle Paul said, if any man changes the gospel, let him be anathema. And Luther believed that. Because of this papal bull, he was commanded to stand before the emperor of Germany at the Diet of Worms, a trial where Luther and his writings will be put on the stand to see if he would recant his writings. Would he forsake these truths of the scripture or would he die? The choice was Luther's. Well, the words that Luther said at this trial were some of the most inspiring words of all of history. Luther said, unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils. They have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no otherwise. God help me. Amen. Friends, we need more people like Luther who will say it's what God says that's important. I stand alone upon the word of God as that children's hymn expresses that we teach our kids. It's the Bible, friend, that changes hearts. It's the word of God that changes lives. It's the word of God that strengthens families and homes and makes us like Jesus Christ. Luther's prayer was God help me and God did help Luther because he was able to escape the death sentence that was given him. He had to go into the castle of Wartburg for a year in captivity to hide because his life would have been taken by the Roman authorities. It was then at this time he wrote his famous hymn that we sang this morning, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And he began the task of translating the Bible for the first time ever in 
into the common tongue of the German people so the German people on their own could open the words of God and be changed by his power and might. This translation developed the German language. This translation helped others, including the King James Bible translators who gave us our Bible that we have today. After Luther's time in hiding, he continued this great work of the Reformation. He helped develop congregational singing. Before Luther, the church did not sing. After Luther, as you heard expressed by Brother Cobb this morning, Luther shared that singing was a gift of God. We'll be singing in heaven according to the book of Revelation. They sang in the Old Testament, and so we should be singing praises to our God today. He married a woman named Katerina von Bora, which you have a bulletin insert about. And he set a model for other ministers. You see, Rome had began to teach a few hundred years earlier that ministers could not be married in direct contrast and opposition to the word of God, which says a bishop or a pastor must be the husband of one wife. So he made it easier for other ministers to get married. Luther did incredible things. We can't discuss them all today. You've heard about the man. He did some things that were wrong, too. Luther was not perfect, but Luther was changed and Luther was used greatly. We, of course, abhor any of the anti-Semitism that may have came from Luther in his sickly last days. But I want you to understand the man was used greatly of God. Let me share with you his deathbed experience. And then we will look at the message of the Reformation. While on his deathbed at the age of 63, after suffering two heart attacks, the last words Luther ever uttered were a prayer and a scripture. And I think this is so dear. He prayed to God and he said, I thank thee, O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that thou hast revealed thy Son to me, on whom I have believed, whom I have loved, whom I have preached and confessed and worshipped. He then quoted John 3.16, his last words to his church, his last words of praise to his God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so the man went to be with his maker, with the Lord Jesus Christ. May God grant us many more who are willing to stand as strong as Martin Luther. You've heard about the man this morning. Now let's talk very briefly about the message, the five major points of the Reformation. Point number one, if you have your notes, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Luther emphasized this in his teaching, that no creed of the church, no council of believers, no individual can be taken as an authority over the Bible. The scriptures must be our authority, as they are the words of God. At Luther's day, the Roman church said... Whenever the Pope spoke, he spoke ex cathedra. He spoke out the inspired words of God. Luther said, no, the words are settled. We have them in the scriptures. God's word alone must be our sure foundation. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, it is written. He answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If we want to have a new reformation today, our foundation must be the words of the living God. When Luther was on trial, as I read a few moments ago, he said, Unless I am convicted by Scripture and plain reason, I will not accept the authority of any other. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. This is what we need in the church. 2 Timothy 3 tells us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you don't feel complete in your Christian life, if you don't feel like you're doing all that God can use you to do, friend, get in the Word of God. God's word has that power. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, said, Think in every line you read that God is speaking to you, because he is. In John 10, Jesus said, The scripture cannot be broken. In Luke eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus said, Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. In Acts 6, the Bible says, The word of God increased, and the disciples multiplied greatly. In Romans 10, the Bible says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In 2 Timothy 2, it says, The word of God is not bound. In Hebrews 4, 12, the Bible says, The word of God is alive. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. You want to have an alive church. You want to have an alive faith, you want to be a completed Christian, go to the scriptures alone and you'll find all the support and the strength and the encouragement. You will need church. 
The preface of the Geneva Bible said, The Bible is the light to our past. It is the key of the kingdom of heaven. It is our comfort in affliction. It is our short sword and our shield against Satan. It is the school of all wisdom. It is the glass where we behold God's face. It is the testimony of his favor. It is the only food and nourishment of our souls. Friend, may the church get back to sola scriptura, scripture alone. First Peter says, we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. If a church wants to be a part of the new reformation, the first thing we need to do is commit ourselves to the scriptures as our authority. I pray they're the authority in your life and that they will be the authority over our church. The second point of the Reformation was sola gratia, grace alone. We all know what grace is. It's getting that which you don't deserve. It's God unmerited or unearned favor to man, to an undeserving man. The late theologian James Montgomery Boyce said it's not only God's favor to an undeserving man, it's God's favor to a man who deserves just the opposite of God's grace. No human method or work or technique can lead us to salvation. It is only through the grace of God. If baptism saved you, it would not be of grace, it would be of works. If walking an aisle saved you, it would not be of grace, it would be of works. If praying a special prayer saved you, it would not be of grace, it would be of works. If joining the church physically saved you, it would not be of grace, it would be of works. Friend, it is trusting in Christ alone. Faith alone, the just shall live by faith that saves us. Amen? John 1.17 says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Acts 15 says we believe through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved. Romans 3 says we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption in Jesus Christ. We all deserve God's judgment in hell, but through Jesus Christ and His grace we get heaven. Luther said Jesus receives public sinners as whether they're prostitutes or they're dishonest or they're publicans and murderers. If they hear his word and believe in him, he forgives them, even when their sins are so many and so great. He even makes them righteous and holy. He makes them God's children and heirs of everlasting life and salvation. He does it out of mere grace and mercy, without any deserving or deserts, without any good works, and without any worthiness of their own. Friend, we need to get back to the scriptures alone, sola scriptura. We need to get back to grace alone, sola gratia. We cannot earn our salvation. The third point of the Reformation was sola fide, faith alone. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. It is not through our works. It is through trusting in Christ and the work that Jesus has done on the cross, which we are saved. It is manifested through faith. This is why Romans 1 says, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That was the verse Luther quoted and changed his life. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 17, If you have the faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, remove it, and it will be removed. He didn't say if you have the good works. He said if you have the faith, God will use you in this way. Martin Luther said faith is not only necessary that thereby the ungodly may become justified and saved before God and their hearts be settled in peace. It is necessary in every other respect. May we be a church that is a people of faith. May we stand on the scriptures, sola scriptura. May we stand on the grace of God alone, sola gratia. May we stand on faith each day that God will supply our needs, that God is there. He hears our prayers. He hears our requests. He cares about our families. He loves us as his word is promised, and he will save us and keep us. Faith alone. The fourth point is solus Christus, Christ alone. Only through Christ is salvation attained. Not popes. Not Mary worship. Not saint worship, not priests in confession of sins, no other persons. This is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Luther said, anyone who preaches a God to me, who did not die for me on the cross, I will not receive this God. It's Christ alone. We live in an age where people say it's okay if you're a Buddhist, it's okay if you're a Muslim, it's okay if you're a Hindu. We're all getting to God on different paths. Friend, 
The Bible says it's Jesus alone. It's the Messiah alone. It's the Savior alone. Jesus said, I am the door. He didn't say anything about anyone else but himself alone. He said, if any man enter in me, he will be saved. He shall go in and out and find pasture. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Solus Christus, Christ alone. And then the last point of the Reformation, a point our church has really understood in recent days, which has excited me as your pastor, to see you pray for this point. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Because salvation is of God, because it has been accomplished by God, because it is for God's glory, we must glorify Him always. We must live our entire lives before the face of God, under the authority of God, and for the glory of God alone. Everything we do must be for God's glory, not for ours, not for the church, not for the Pope, not for a dead saint, not for us, but for God alone. We're building a new church sanctuary here. We are not building it for the glory of Klondike. We're not building it so we have a heritage here. We are building it for the glory of God to see souls come to Christ, for the preaching of the word of God to the nation, for the preaching of the word of God to the city, for the preaching of the word of God in our homes and in our families to strengthen us. We do not do it for ourselves. We do it for God and for His purposes in this earth. Matthew 6. Jesus, as He was praying the Lord's Prayer, He said, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. In Romans 11, Paul said, For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul said, Whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, Do it for the glory of God. This is why in line 62 of the 95 Thesis, Luther closed and he said, The true treasure of the church is the holy gospel of the glory and the grace of God. Friend, let's be the church of Pensacola that leads the new Reformation. A reformation based on sola scriptura, the scriptures as our authorities in our homes, in our families, in our lives, and in our church. Sola gratia, acknowledging that it's only God's grace to us undeserving sinners. Your pastor being number one. I'm undeserving. Let us base our church on the truth of sola fide, faith alone. It's our trust in Christ that God uses in our lives. It is trusting in Him alone. May we as well... Herald the message of Sola Christus, Christ alone. Jesus saves. We have heard the joyful sound, church. Jesus saves. He saved my soul from hell. He can save you too by his power and might. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he's near. And may we learn the fifth point, Soli Deo Gloria. All we do, we do it to please God. We do it for his glory. God uses a church that honors him. So may we be that church in this year. May we go to our God in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for salvation. Lord, I am thankful for this congregation you have brought together today. Lord, I ask your blessings on them. Blessings on their home and their families. Blessings on their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. Father, I ask your blessings on their lives as they strive for these truths. Lord, as we live according to your word, as we are thankful for your grace, Lord, as we are thankful for the faith you have given us, the faith that strengthens us, as we are thankful for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us and saved us, as we do our best for your glory and honor. Lord, I pray you use this church in a great and mighty way. Lord, if anyone has not experienced the change that comes through knowing you, Our Lord, I pray your spirit would work on their heart even this morning, that they may call out to you and be saved. Father, that your grace would fill them and change them. Bless us now as we consider the words of this song. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. 
If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.